It was in 1979 that Jerry Goldsmith's title theme heralded the arrival of Star Trek The Movie, which featured the entire cast of the long-running television series, headed, of course, by the indomitable William Shatner. Mr. Scott, an alien object of unbelievable destructive power is less than three days away from this planet. The only starship in interception range is the Enterprise. Ready or not, she launches in 12 hours. I'm replacing you as captain of the Enterprise. You personally are assuming command? Yeah. Admiral, this is an almost totally new Enterprise. You don't know her a tenth as well as I do. That's why you're staying aboard. Alien or not, Mr. Spock is an undoubted favorite with everyone, including Gene Rodenberry. I think, first of all, it's mixed blood characters have always been popular. The clash of the cultures well, goes all back to the old Hollywood movie, The Pale Face. But I think a great deal of it is the fact that we are all in it. We all do, in a sense, feel like aliens. We're, oh, how many friends do you make in a whole life with all these millions of people around you? Four or five, if you're really lucky? We're all trying to communicate with each other. And here's Spock from a strange place, only half human, having trouble communicating and wanting things and being unable to have them. It's a, it's a powerful image. I think also another thing that helped, is I had a theory that if I made him look a little satanic, and the ears certainly help, that the ladies might find that a very attractive face. And, uh, and I'm not putting down ladies, but uh, history is full of the fact that they slightly, a hint of slight evil, dashing evil. And you have, of course, you have that in all the great heroes, Don Juan, Errol Flynn. I found even out as a teenager, if the mother said, I like that Gene Roddenberry, I got nowhere. If she said, don't you ever see him again, I've heard he's an awful boy. Uh, the girl was always interested. Maybe the ladies deserve a applause for being daring and wanting something that isn't manly pamly. It's important to understand that the Star Trek fans and the so-called Trekkies are not just a band of screaming kids. They, uh, they include senators, uh, college presidents. I was recently at a big Midwest college where I was told that Dr. So-and-so, the president, or the head of the Department of Sociology, and this is, and I won't tell you the university because it's, it's one of the largest, I was going to introduce me that evening. And he certainly did it. At 7.30 he came out, I was introduced, he was wearing a Captain Kirk suit. A gray-headed man with a string of degrees. I hardly knew how to relate with him. <laughs> Gene Rodenberry, creator and now executive consultant on the Star Trek film series. Admiral Kirk's heroics, however, are not only confined to the screen, as you'll hear in a moment. Captain's log, star date 7412.6. 2.7 hours from launch. In order to intercept the intruder at the earliest possible time, we must now risk engaging warp drive while still within the solar system. It was during the shooting of the latest adventure, The Search for Spock, that William Shatner found himself battling with a real-life fire, which came dangerously close to destroying the Enterprise. There was a lot of flames in the uh, special effects and I hate fire, uh, that causes a great deal of apprehension. At one point, at the finale of, uh, of a planet that breaks down, there were 15 banks of 10 to 20 foot long fingers of flame coming through the, the bottom of the stage, uh, which I was jumping around in. I was coming out of the um, stage we were working on and saw clouds of black smoke billowing up just a few stages over. And somebody came running by saying the back lot is on fire. And I ran over and saw uh, furiously burning fire that uh, was consuming the whole of the back lot. It looked like all the Paramount was going up in flames. And, but right beside the back lot was the stage in which our most extensive set was built. And I ran into the uh, stage and it was uh, filled with smoke and just a finger of fire high up uh, on the wall facing the uh, fire outside. Uh, and with a group of other men, uh, we got some hoses going and started um, 
playing the uh, water on the on the flames that were just starting on the wall. Uh, we knew that the set was made of resin and glue and uh, and fiberglass, and that if the flames hit it, uh, not only would it burn uh, like an explosion, but the fumes would be toxic. Nevertheless, everybody stayed, but it was 15 seconds from um, a terrible, terrible accident, and it was a real near disaster, and I had a small part in helping put out the flames, and that was uh, memorable for me. was launched on American television on September the 8th, 1966. And following a record-breaking run of three years, it still refused to die. For when its 79 hour-long episodes were syndicated across the states and were distributed worldwide, its popularity grew even stronger. In the beginning, however, 1965, when William Shatner and the crew were trying to get the pilot off the ground, the cast were approaching the subject far too reverently. Well, if I recall, the flaws were everybody taking themselves too seriously. Uh, we are in space, you know, the final frontier. Everybody was doing a final frontier, was acting. When I was going to college in Montreal, we, there was, I put myself through college on doing radio. And there was a Bible show on the CBC. And uh, every Sunday morning, the Canadian actors would get on the Bible show. It was the only sh professional show around, so everybody scramble to get on it, you know. You had to have a Bible voice. You spoke to Peter and John this way, as though that's the way they spoke, instead of being fishermen or whatever. So that's the way they were speaking uh, uh, on Star Trek. Great dignity, because we're in space. As against being in space, I mean, you're... That, it's every day, and this is what it is. That was one of the mistakes uh, I felt they made. And uh, then the magic, of course, was the magic of science fiction, and uh, the possibilities of these entrancing stories that they had. I can only say about Captain Kirk that I've always played him, and I think he has been written uh, thusly, that he re reacts and acts in a way that I would love to be able to if I were in the same situation. I mean, he's brave uh, in, in times of danger. and then, Well, he's kind of Alexander. Uh, I took that as a model. Uh, Alexander the Great, who also went out into into those strange new worlds. So uh, there was much of Alexander the Great, uh, intellectual curiosity as well as a, fi a soldier philosopher, the Greek ideal. When we were making it, it was another series. There were a lot of aficionados, a lot of um, people who, uh, who liked it very much, but there was no sense that this was going to be a phenomenon the way it has become. It gave hope to people whose background thoughts are always that the end of the world is nigh. Star Trek One was a, a, a good attempt at a really great idea. Uh, we fell short in, in some areas, uh, mostly because of the lack of time uh, in editing what was essentially two motion pictures. One was the live action, and the other was the special effects. And the, the marriage between the two was somewhat faulty because of the lack of time in which to edit it. But I think you got your money's worth. Um, I think that uh, on second viewing, uh, Star Trek I will, will have more uh, quality to it than uh, has been first uh, thought of. Space, the final frontier. These are the continuing voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Her ongoing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life forms, and new civilizations to boldly go where no man has gone before. A 
master of the split infinitive, Leonard Nimoy. Now, he'll never forget the time that he and Mr. Spock first became acquainted. My agent called me and said, Gene Roddenberry, who just who was the producer of the show you just did, has called and is interested in talking to you about, uh, about a pilot that he's going to do. It's a science fiction pilot. There's a character in it that he thinks she might be right for. So I, I came to the studio to have a meeting with Gene to discuss it, and he had some thoughts um, uh, clearly in mind about what the character was going to be all about. Some of the areas were still undeveloped and, and uh, were to be discussed and experimented with. My concern was that he was talking about an alien. He was talking about a man who would look alien uh, and who would be half human, which made him interesting for me immediately because there would be the internal conflict to play, and I think that's very important for the character. Um, but as I said, my concern was that, that he wanted an alien look, and the one thing that he had clearly defined in his mind at that moment was pointed ears. Now, pointed ears could be a joke, and my concern was that I was being asked to play a character who could become the Dumbo of the 1960s. Yeah. Certainly wasn't interested in doing anything like that. But as we talked, I did get... Uh, the sense that he was intending to develop a character that had dignity, that had style, grace, poise, uh, intelligence. Uh, and I thought with all of that on the uh, one side and pointed ears on the other, perhaps we could pull off a character who would be intriguing, who would be different, uh, who would be interesting, and uh, would not be a joke. That was the point. I was most concerned about that. And I think we managed to do it. After the show had been on the air a week or two, I started getting some fan mail. And they brought it to me on the set. And I thought, oh, that's nice. Um, I, they brought me 20 or 30 letters. I sat down one day during lunch and personally sent notes to and sent autographed photographs to everybody who had written to me in that batch of mail. And then a couple of days later, they brought me another package of mail, and now there were 80 or 90 letters. And I thought, well, this is getting to be a chore, but I'll try to do it if I possibly can to answer all this mail. So I did, over a period of two or three days. And then the next batch that came was several hundred pieces of mail. And then, within three or four more weeks, it was up to several thousand pieces of mail. Each time they brought me the days of the week's delivery. So obviously, it became physically impossible to respond to everybody personally. And we did see to it that everybody got some kind of response, photographs or whatever. But it grew uh, geometrically, and um, if we didn't know whether or not the series was going to be tremendously successful, at least we did know immediately, that, or very quickly, that we had a character that had captured a lot of people's imagination. I thought that the pattern would be similar to the end pattern of any television series. You'd have a period of perhaps two or three years of reruns, and then it would quietly go away. And that seemed to be the course it was taking in 19... 69, 70, 71. In 72, I was under contract at Universal, and suddenly my phone started ringing more and more regularly, and the mail started picking up again, and all of it was Star Trek. And I thought, this is really strange. I don't know where this is all coming from, but what, had, what was happening then was the phenomenal rebirth of the series in syndication. Colleges were stopping because all the students were in the, in the lounges watching Star Trek. Be scheduled at dinner time uh, five nights a week at six o'clock or seven o'clock, and I'd be getting mail from all these ladies and telling me that I was destroying their dinner hour because their kids and their husbands wouldn't come to eat dinner. Um, it was an amazing uh, rebirth, and I don't I don't know of any other series that's ever had that kind of phenomenon. The death of Spark is like an open wound. It seems that I have left the noblest part of myself back there on that newborn planet. Status, Mr. Sewell. Of course, Admiral. Estimating space dock in 2.1 hours. Very well. Mr. Chekhov, I'll need a pre-approach scan. Take the science station, please. Yes, sir. Uhura. Any response from Starfleet on our Project Genesis inquiries? No, sir. There is no response. That's very odd. Scotty, progress report. It's almost done, sir. You'll be fully automated by the time we dock. The timing is excellent, Mr. Scott. You fix the barn door after the horses come home. How much refit time till we can take her out again? Eight weeks, sir. But you don't have eight weeks, so I'll do it for you in two. Mr. Scott, have you always multiplied your repair estimates by a factor of four? 
Certainly, sir. How else can I keep my reputation as a miracle worker? Your reputation is secure, Scotty. Mr. Sulu, take the car. I'll be at my quarters. Aye, sir. Sir? I was wondering, are they planning a ceremony when we get in? I mean a reception? A hero's welcome sounds that what you like. Oh, God knows it should be. This time we've paid for the party with our dearest blood. Well, you don't have to be a Trekkie to know that in the latest adventure, Leonard Nimoy, minus pointed ears, has turned to Rector. Mr. Spock, however, will always be part of it. He's a man of dignity. Uh, he's intelligent. He's charming. He's witty. Uh, he's attractive. And I have become all of those things. 